turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter six, and we're going to read the first 11 verses. First Corinthians six, starting at verse one. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more are things that pertain to this life? If ye then have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that should be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth the law with brothers, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you because ye go to law, law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong, and defraud, and that your brethren. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Let's pray. Father, as we gather together here in this room to open the word of God and to learn the principles that are in this passage, would you guide our thoughts, let the Spirit work in our hearts and May we just commit ourselves to indeed show the kind of love that shocks the world and shows the difference that you make in us. We pray in your name. Amen. Way back in 1981, a show started on television called The People's Court. I'm sure you have seen it somewhere in your lifetime. I think Judge Wapner was the first person on the judge, and they've gone through three or four of them. It's still on the air uh, at this point in time, I believe. Um, and basically it was uh, individuals who evidently went to a small claims court about some issues that relate certain things, whether it's sometimes uh, lack of payment or perhaps uh, someone did a job, they didn't do well and they want the money back or it's with things that you don't need a lawyer for, that's what small claims is for. And they would agree to come to that location um, it really wasn't a, a, a court, basically, although I think most of the ones who were judges were literal judges at some time, but it was more like an arbitrator. They just agreed to do whatever was said and so forth. And uh, um, their motto at the end was, if you're un unable to settle your differences, don't fight, take them to court. Now, I suppose, you know, Going to court's a lot better than getting in a fight with somebody, literally. That's, that's probably not the best way of things, doing that. And we certainly have the facilities that do that. It was no different in the days of Paul. Uh, much of our government is modeled after the Roman government and how they worked in that day. Um, but Paul wants them in this city of Corinth and us to realize that, that we're different and we're supposed to do things differently than that of those who are in the world without Christ. We are blessed to have God's love spread abroad in our hearts. Uh, we accept that wonderful love. And then we're commanded that we're supposed to love others with that same type of love. And I think that includes our enemies as well. And you know, the love of God is very clear. It's not a shadowy type of a thing. God's love is unconditional, which means it's open to everyone and anyone, no matter who they are, what they've done. It is demonstrable because he gave his son. We can see that love being evidence wherever he was and what Jesus did on the earth. It's sacrificial because, indeed, it cost Christ everything. And our love is to be similar. Our love is to be unconditional as we treat people as they are. We, it's demonstrable. It's shown in what we do. And it's sacrificial. There are times it costs us to love somebody, but we do it because 
God loved us that way. We want to show that same love to other people around us. Um, that's what we're here for. And, and we're the church, and God has left us here as a church and as his people to make an impact upon the world for Jesus Christ. And Paul is writing to this church, which is not a great example of a church and how a church should function. But from it, we can draw some foundational principles we're looking at, that church is real people, um, the church is full of ministry. And, and here in chapter 5 onward, it's the church is different. Um, we're different because we saw last week we deal effectively with sin in the life. And, and this one, we're different because we model a love that is a, enables us to handle any disagreements in a way that brings honor and glory to God. Now, the problem here, obviously, is um, something's going on with some of the believers in the church, and it has come to the point where they basically have them to court. They are suing each other, as it might be. Um, we don't know what these matters are. Paul doesn't explain them. Um, he just talks about a matter against one another. Um, but he does let us know that it certainly relates to this world here and not to eternal matters or spiritual matters. Because you notice he says in verse 2, he talks about judging the world, how we'll judge the world. But then he talks about the smallest matters. So what's going on in the church is to the eternal reality of judging the world. That's eternal, that's spiritual. He says this is something much more than that, meaning it's limited to this existence here, and it has no lasting eternal value or spiritual value whatsoever. Later on, he says the same thing. Verse 3, he says, you're going to judge angels. How much more things that pertain to this life? And he says the same thing in verse 4. The word life there in that word, on something has gone on between some people and it deals with something here and that's limited to here probably in a we would call it temporal as opposed to eternal uh so a smooth we can surmise maybe it has something to do with money property something to do with issues that uh, we've often seen disagreements come with individuals whatever it might be property and they're not able to figure out how to do it so they do what um, people's court told them to do Take them to court. If we're honest, we, everyone has disagreements. We're all going to have disagreements from time to time. It's natural. I mean, after all, we, we are sinners, and we have a tendency to be self-centered at times, and that often creates disagreements. And Paul's not in that. And, and in some ways, you know, we sort of think, well, what's the big deal of going to court either? I mean, because, again, that is better to do that than actually have a little fight with somebody. Um, but Paul is trying to help the believers here in Corinth understand something, that they and we are here to represent Jesus Christ upon this earth. We're here to present to them how he made a difference. In life. We're here to attest to the truth of who he is. And he says, because they're taking this action and going to court where an unbeliever will decide the matter, he says, what you're really doing is harming and hindering your witness effectively in the city of Corinth. He said, you know, there is a, you, 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 you got a disagreement here and it's come so severe, you're going to take it to court, but who's going to sit there over you? It's going to be someone that has no recognition of God in any way, shape, or form. And yet you're there as God's people and you can't solve it yourselves. You have to come from an unbeliever. Don't you understand? He's saying, how this is going to view to the unbeliever? You know, you're supposed to be showing love. You're supposed to be showing the difference. And, and the early church was the power of a church of great love. I mean, it was the love that impacted the Roman Empire powerfully. As they saw Jew and Gentile eating at the same table, which was unheard of. As they saw bond and slave, you know, masters and slaves sitting together. This kind of love. And yet now he's saying, okay, you have this disagreement. All right, it's there. And when you bring those differences and disagreements in front of those unbelievers and they listen and a lot of times, unfortunately, with the disagreement, a little bit of anger, particularly when he gets to that point in time. And he says, what's the unbeliever thinking as he listens to all this? He's thinking, I don't know if this Jesus really makes a big difference. I mean, they're acting just like, I've seen a lot of people act in my life. And I'm not really impressed by their, quote, love for one another, because 
they don't look like they love one another. And I can tell you from my own experience in ministry, there are times, unfortunately, when believers don't look like they love each other very much. It can get really nasty at times with disagreements. And Paul is trying to help them understand. He said, you've you got to understand something. Um, you, you may come there and, and you may think it's the right thing, but he said, and really you're doing wrong. I mean, verse 5, he says, I'm speaking this to your shame. He says, what you're doing it should cause you to hang your head and say, I'm embarrassed by doing this because it's brought a shame upon you. Later on in verse 7, look what he says. He says, uh, um, now therefore there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law with one another. And by one another he means what happened is one filed a lawsuit and so in retaliation the other filed a lawsuit because that's usually how it works. And the, and the, the word um, um, uh, fault really means a defeat. Utterly complete. He says, by so doing, you actually are losing something. And he's not talking about the, the case. He's not talking about who's going to win or who's going to lose in the particular matter that they're before the court. What he means is you your testimony for Jesus Christ. You're suffering a defeat in the name of Jesus Christ because his name is no longer honored and glorified. People won't see any difference. And so, acted in some way, the believer goes to court. He can win that battle, but he'll lose the war because we're not here to win the small battles of life. We're here to represent Jesus Christ so we can make a, a specific spiritual and eternal difference in someone's soul and life. That's what Paul is saying. He says, you know, I know it happens, but he says the methodology in how it's happening is not going to bring honor and glory to God. So the question is, then what do we do? How do we solve disagreements when they come in a way that brings honor and glory to God? Well, that's what Paul tries to explain to them here. And they're not super complicated, they're just a couple of thoughts. And, and the first one is this one. We use the wisdom God's given to us to solve these issues. Um, you notice he talks about how we're going to judge the world one day. We're going to judge angels one day, which is a powerful thing. But we're not going to be in that position because of who we are. We're in that position because of what Christ has done in us. Uh, you know, we've been changed, we've been a new life. The Spirit dwells within us and lives within us. And he gives us wisdom to be able to handle things in life. Wisdom means right knowledge applied in a practical way. He even, even kind of tells him, he says, listen. He says, listen, verse 4, he says, if you have these issues, um, go to someone that's least esteemed in the church. In other words, there's someone in the church you think perhaps is really not that spiritual, but they have enough wisdom to solve the problem. Better to take it to them to take it to an unbeliever that doesn't know anything about God. And, and then he even goes further. He sits there and says, I, I speak to your shame. Is there not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. He says, isn't, isn't there someone there in the church who knows the Lord and has wisdom to be able to fix this problem between the two of you? Implying, I think, in, in some ways he's implying, can't you both fix it yourselves? But if you can't, then there's somebody there to that in a way that brings honor and glory to God? Because, because that's, we have wisdom to do that. It's not our wisdom, it's God's wisdom. The Spirit leads us, directs us, and helps us figure out what to do and how to handle things. But that wisdom involves three simple steps. And I'm going to use the phrase TLC. Now, TLC typically means tender, loving care. Okay, that's not what it means here. TLC means we talk with each other. That's the first step. When there's disagreements, we talk to each other. And, and that's wisdom. We talk. Okay, you're not going to solve a disagreement until you talk to each other about the situation. And when we say talk, we mean talk. We don't mean yell, scream, holler. We don't mean words of, of anger, words that are the blame, words that attack a person and go this way and that way, words that become hostile and just gets to the point where there's uncomfortable tension among you. You talk. You just talk about what's going on, what's happening. You share your perspective. They share their perspective. Because a lot of times we discover in our disagreements that the reason why we disagree is we don't understand what's going on in that person's life. And when they talk to us, we, oh, I didn't know that. We, oh, okay, okay, we got that. Talking is the first step. Now, if it gets to the point of severe, it's still nice to have maybe an objective party there, but they're, you're still talking to each other. And then talking is not enough. L means listen. We've got to listen to each other. Listen. Pay attention to what we have each other to say. A lot of times with the disagreements, and I know because I've had them in my life as well, 
we have a tendency to become very defensive when we disagree with somebody. Particularly, you know, if they're coming uh, at us, and, and particularly maybe if we know that we're at fault, and we don't want to admit that because that's the self-centered part of us, and we don't want to do that. And so we get defensive. And when you get defensive, you put up a roadblocks, and that means you can't listen to people. Because what they didn't through your, your defensive posture, and you're not really hearing what they're saying. So we have to really listen to each other. To sit there and be quiet and pay attention and listen. Listen to what's going on. I know there's sometimes when there are disagreements, um, and I've seen it with individuals that I have dealt with and counseled, where um, it's good to have someone there and they, they listen to what's going on and, and they can hear things that those two don't hear. And then by the wisdom of God, they can say, hey, listen, let me, let me tell you what I'm hearing, okay? And, and that can guide a little bit, and sometimes that's necessary to do that. That's kind of what Paul was talking about. But we talk, we listen, and then C is the most important part. We carry the matter and each other to God in prayer. We carry each other in those disagreements and the per- situation to God in prayer. Be honest with you, as believers, we should be praying about that disagreement long before we come to talk to each other about it. Already praying about it, praying about my attitude, I have done, God show me what I need to do in my life to make changes, praying for that person, that God work, praying that as we get together, we do so in a manner that honors and glorifies God, that we can fix this, praying with each other right there, can solve it, because the issue here Paul wants, he doesn't want you to, to fix this disagreement, he wants you to fix it in such a way that you and that brother are reconciled again and in Christ again. Because a lot of times you go to court, um, you may win, but the person over there that you sued, they're not your friend anymore. They sit over here, you sit over here, don't talk to each other. Paul says that's not the way we want to solve the problem. We want, we want to solve the disagreements. We don't want to just solve the disagreement. We want to resolve them to the point where the, the persons in Christ are now one again. That's what we're supposed to be. And I think prayer is essential to getting that done. It's hard to pray with when you, when you have hostility to them, you know, it's difficult. I mean, you really start praying for somebody, that hostility begins to disappear rapidly because you begin to love them as God wants you to love them. And I think it's essential that when disagreement comes, sit down and talk, we listen, and, and come to some conclusion, but before anything else is done, we sit and we pray for God to be honored in our life. Pray for each other, pray for God to help us be kind and loving and forgiving, people that he wants us to be. When uh, Hitler ruled Germany back in World War II, um, he commanded all the churches to unite as one church. So it didn't make any difference what your church was. He wanted one church in Germany. And he did that so he could control the church. And it was within Germany what's called the Brethren denomination. Um, I'm not sure if they're Plymouth Brethren or not. Uh, today we have Plymouth Brethren in the United States. Um, they basically don't believe in pastors. They did everyone together, working together. Um, I always thought it was kind of funny. One of my professors in seminary was a, uh, he was a Plymouth Brethren. That was his, yeah, he was in seminary training guys to be pastors. I always thought that was kind of interesting. But, since his denomination didn't believe in pastors. But, um, uh, and, and what happened in that denomination Half of the church agreed to comply. Half the church refused to comply with Hitler. Well, obviously, those who agreed to comply, their life was much easier in Germany. Those who refused to comply faced much more complicated issues. In fact, the article I read said virtually every family who refused to listen to Hitler had at least one or more members of their family that died in the concentration camps because they were arrested and put in camps. That's painful. And then when the war is over and things have gone away, the brethren are here again, and guess what? Loved ones, because they refused to listen to Hitler, don't like the ones who complied and listened to Hitler. There's a lot of business going on, a lot of resentment. That's pretty serious stuff, okay? 
I mean, if you were there, we would understand the thing. This is pretty serious stuff. You, you, you said, I think God wants me to say, no, I'm not going to listen to this. And because you take this stand, lost loved ones in probably some very difficult ways. I mean, you suffered a little bit. And you look across the aisle, and here are these individuals who didn't suffer at all because they thought it was right to do so. And you're thinking, that's not right. That's not fair. That's what God wants us to do. A lot of bitterness and resentment. And, and the leaders in the churches knew, knew we, can't, we can't live like this. That's not how God's people are supposed to live. There's got to be forgiveness. There's got to be understanding. And so they agreed to come together and deal with the issue and talk about it. And they prayed about it. They prayed with each other. They prayed about the situation. And the article said that all around the churches, people were confessing, asking forgiveness. And people were crossing the aisles other and they were one again so I said how did it happen we just brought our out of confession to each other and the spirit just brought us back together to be again. that's a powerful display to the church to the world my friend I mean, because they look for God And they had a great win in Germany because of that situation. And times we, um, I, verity, but that make any difference. We still need to follow the same wisdom: to talk, listen, and talk, and pray to God about it. But then there's another thing we need to do, and that is we have to practice tough love sometimes. Practice tough love. Now, I'm not. Um, but I, I, I wanted to know where did that come from? Uh, you know, I'm thankful for the internet today. You know, we can do anything. We can find anything we want to find. I didn't have to drive to some library and dig, dig, dig. I just simply Googled it and said, who is it that started Tough Love? And I got an answer. 1968, working with high-risk youth in New York City which I can think would be a really complicated issue. And he entitled it Tough Love. And that's where most people think it came from. And by what he had to become... How this makes you feel towards me? You may hate my guts, but I love you. You, tough. Do to help this person get their life back where it's supposed to be. A lot of times we see it in, in uh, to help this person deal with alcohol or something else. Um, that's not what I'm talking about here. Okay, that's not the thing we're talking about. We're not talking about trying to do something to help somebody else. Tough love in this context means that as a believer in Christ, I'm willing to do whatever it's going to cost right between him and him. It's tough. That's the message. Because you go to wrong. Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? In other words, he says, take the loss, don't worry about it. That's hard to do. Loving each other and doing wonderful things for each other. But now if it's going to cost me something, even if it's going to cost me my, my, my self-respect perhaps, and say that I'm the one that was in the wrong, even though I knew it wasn't in the wrong, love does. I mean, God's love costs me everything. And Paul is saying, okay, this is your, whatever it might be, why didn't one of you I'll pay this much and I'll pay it more, okay? Or, or maybe it's a property issue. You say, you, if you've got a problem, I'll tell you what, I'll just move over. I'll do whatever it's going to take. I'll be fine. 
Or maybe there's simply going, you know what? You're right. You're, you're right. I was wrong. I didn't sit and done that, blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? And Paul doesn't really care who's right or wrong in the situation. What he wants to see is, is the believers is powerful and dynamic. And he says, you know, there's sometimes and do what's best to bring each other back together again. That's tough to do. It's hard. Uh, because there's that. You know, I'm right. Paul says, I don't care if you're right or not. I mean, he'll talk about this later on in the passage, too, about to, we'll see about, uh, when we have freedom to disagree in certain areas. He said, you know, my love for my brother will stop me from doing certain things because I'm not going to let it bother I'm not going to do that. Love is tough sometimes. It's hard. But he said that's what we should be doing. When the disagreements, whatever they might be, if we talk, we share, the bottom line is, hey, we love each other, and I'm going to do whatever it's going to take to be reconciled with my fellow believer in a way that brings honor and glory to God. Whatever the cost, it's going to happen. Because I love him. I love her. And I love God above everything else. We practice tough love. I read a cute story about a father who took his two young children to the store and uh, had a daughter named Helen, a son named Brandon. Brandon was a little born. Helen was a little older. And when they got there, I think it was like a hardware store, um, they discovered that outside the hardware store, someone had set up a petting zoo, you know, in the parking lot. And so the kids were excited. They wanted to go petting zoo and, and their supervision. So they said, Dad, can we go to petting zoo? Will you go to the store? Of course, back to sure, no problem. So he got up, gave each one of them, and he went into the store. Well, a few minutes later, he was surprised because Helen came. And he said, why aren't you in the zoo? Why aren't you, you know, I know you like animals. She said, well, Dad, um, in order for us to get in, it costs 50 cents per person. You gave me a quarter, and you gave my brother a quarter. So I just gave my quarter to my brother and let him do it, okay? Because after all, Dad, didn't you teach us love gives to others? And his dad was quite pleased with his little girl. As she understood, I want to go to the zoo. I want to go my brother, but I'll let my brother do it instead. I won't worry about it. That's what love does. It wasn't easy for her to do. And in fact, what was interesting of the story was, is that the father didn't sit there and say, well, honey, I'll take you and pay for you. He just took her out there and they stood outside the zoo and watched and enjoyed seeing Brandon do all this stuff. Because he was kind of even teach her a greater lesson, that real love enjoys seeing what other people are doing, even though we don't get to do the same thing. Real love rejoices in all this kind of stuff. And his daughter learned a very powerful lesson about what love really is. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. For we so love each other, we give whatever we can to help each other and be the people God wants us to be. And sometimes that's really hard to do. But we do that. Why? Because we're different. Look what Paul says in verse 9. He said, don't you know, don't you have this? The righteous, unrighteous, not inherit the kingdom of God. And he lists all these sins in there. We don't need to go over all of them. Because basically all the sins that are listed there are self-centered viewpoint. He says, those who don't know Jesus Christ, they've never been born again. They don't have a new life, a new nature. They are living a life that's fully self-centered. He said, they don't belong to God and they will never inherit the kingdom of God. Because they're lost. And our goal here is to try to do what we can to take them out of the lost and see them brought into the kingdom of God and love him and understand a new life. He says, that's, that's what you were once. I mean, I love this verse. He says, don't you know this? And then he goes in verse 11. And such were some of you. He says, hey, you people, you, you, do some of those things I named. That's you. That's what you used to live like. You used to be a self-centered person. A one who was lost, one who was outside the kingdom of God. That's how you were, but strong and versative. But on the contrary, you know, justified. He says, you're different. You don't look like washed in the blood of Christ and made clean of the guilt of sin. You have been sanctified, set apart to God, and you belong completely unto him, holy saints. You are justified. You have been declared righteous and then are made right so you can be right with God and be with him now and forever. You have been transformed within and now you belong to God. 
and the implication is, since this has happened to you, and you belong in the kingdom of God, then your life should look like you belong in the kingdom of God. Since you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, then you should live as one who's been set free from the penalty and power of sin. You have been made holy, you belong to God, then you should live a life that says, I belong to God, not to this world at all and not to myself. Because I'm right with God, I should live a life that's right for God. Doing everything he wants me to do, living everything for me. And you see, he's really going to life. They forgot from the world. Changed, transformed, holy. And even in these matters of disagreements, he says, you are failing to show to the world the difference Jesus has made in you. And he says, I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to be like that. And I don't think God wants us to be like that. He wants us to show the world how we're different. And we do that because we have a love for one another that transcends all disagreements and helps us sit down, talk, listen, pray, and remain at one each other no matter what happens. And that's what we're supposed to be doing as believers in Christ. And back in the 60s, it's kind of nice to, to I, I, um, I, when I talk to college students, and I say the 60s, they, they were over like, oh, what's a 60? I don't know what that is. And, you know, I teach them freshmen. Freshmen are 18 years old. We're what, 2021? They don't even know what 2000 means. Like 2000 is like, whoa, a long time ago. You know, it's like ancient to them. Um, I know some of you lived in the 60s. Oh, I have, I have. Okay, so I'm, I'm not, we're all, we're, so you understand when I say the 60s, what life was like in America. It was a challenging time. Vietnam, all kinds of issues. Um, um, a time frame, late 60s, 70s, a lot of protests came out. Um, Bob Dylan, um, Simon Garfunkel, some other ones. But also some of the songs that encourage us to, to love each other. You know, encourage us to try to put aside the, the problems and try to be a, a good people together. And spiritually being the same problem. I mean, the church also had problems as well. Dealing with a new generation, everything going on. And I was a newer generation, with the older generation. And there was a lot of tension going on. It was normal. But despite that, God's people are supposed to still love one another and show the world the difference. And in 1960, a Catholic priest who served God in the south side of Chicago. And of course, he sees what's going on in life. And should be different. I mean, Jesus told us in John 13 that I want you to love one another, which gives a clear understanding. But then he says, by this, all will know you are my disciples. In other words, because you show your love for each other like I loved you, the world will see you belong to me. And so he wrote a song that became like a folksy song that all were back in those days, trying to remind us of who we are and how we're supposed to live. And you, you probably recognize the song. It is in our hymn. No, I, I checked to make sure it was there. I was surprised. Um, and I don't know if we've sung it or not, or not here, but it goes this way. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity one day will be restored and there know we are Christians by our love. By our love. They will know we are Christians by our love. I think that's hold true to this very day. A lot of things have changed in America, but uh, our love for God and for each other shouldn't have changed. If anything, it should get stronger the more we walk with God every step of the way. And that love enables us to deal with the differences and disagreements we have in a way that brings honor and glory to God so that the world looks and says, man, you got something that I don't have. 
but hopefully we can point them to Jesus Christ and they'll find him and the kind of love that he has for us. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today, ask you to work in our hearts and our lives. We want to live in a way that just points people fully to you. And we know disagreements will come, but it doesn't make any difference. Help us to learn to deal with them in a way that Paul outlines, talk, listen, pray, and above all, love one another. Even if it means we're willing to take the wrong, if we can reconcile and get back one again. We pray that may happen in our life. We ask in your name, amen. I'm going to ask you.